Thank you so much to everybody for coming along. Um, we're talking about grammar. You've got a great session by Penny Ur after my session. Penny, who is somebody whose books I read when I uh, began training and were actually very influential to me. So you're really lucky as well having Penny here today. Um, let's get straight into action. Uh, putting grammar in context from my experience, I've got a strange question to ask you first. There are four things on the screen. We've got ABBA, we've got a hamburger, we've got somebody binge watching with lots of popcorn, and we've got teaching grammar. And my strange question to begin this session is what might they all have in common? In the chat box, any, uh, any wild thoughts? What do they have in common? Any ideas at all? Making grammar more fun, that's a nice idea, Daphne. Expressing likes, that's an interesting idea too. Likes and dislikes, that's also interesting. Making grammar digestible, I like that one, Daphne, that's a good one, I like that. I get, I get what you mean. Pleasure, hobby, okay, well, this is what I think, okay, and this is my personal opinion uh, from my experience. Um, I think that they're all guilty pleasures. So a guilty pleasure, um, probably you know that a guilty pleasure is something that we like, but feel that we shouldn't. Uh, so for example, ABBA, I don't know, maybe now they're more fashionable, but certainly a few years ago, um, you wouldn't say they were your favorite group and you might dance around to Dancing Queen, but you wouldn't say they were your favorite group. Hamburgers, everybody talks about fast food, a bad thing, but at the same time, uh, fast food, we all quite like a hamburger from time to time. And of course, we all like binge watching, but we might uh, think that binge watching is, of course, not a very valuable uh, use of your time. Grammar, I think that grammar is a guilty pleasure. That's my theory. Uh, my theory is that um, we like grammar, but feel that we shouldn't like it. We feel a little bit guilty about liking it. And I'm going to explore that concept in the first half of this session today. Um, somebody said why guilty? Well, I think somebody said this morning, grammar feels a little bit old fashioned. It feels like it's not something that's very, you know, it's not like mm, fashionable. Um, and, and I think that people think, oh, you know, we don't teach grammar, we do other things in our lang language classrooms. So that's my theory. Um, before I get any further in my talk, um, I'm just explaining the title of the session was my experience and I've got three different kinds of experience, I suppose. Um, I've got my experience as a language learner at secondary school. My favorite subjects at school were French and Spanish um, and I studied them at university. But when I learned French and Spanish in secondary school, we did lots and lots of grammar, lots and lots of translation, and we didn't do almost any speaking. Um, that was my experience. Lots of grammar, lots of translation, lots of memorizing grammar, grammar tables, um, but not much using English. I then trained to be a secondary school teacher, teaching, in fact, French and Spanish before I trained to teach English. And the situation was totally different. The situation was suddenly, we shouldn't teach grammar, we should teach communicative English, and we should teach functional language above all. So we um, spent a lot of time doing dialogues in a railway station to buy a ticket, maybe dialogues in a supermarket dialogues. And that was basically the way we uh, I trained to teach. And we didn't really do much language analysis. It was basically functional language, communicative language. Now, my experience of uh, after 35 years of teaching and 30 years of writing uh, is neither of those. And I think my experience will become clear uh, throughout this session, how I personally feel about teaching grammar. So let's go back to my original possible concept of a guilty pleasure. As teachers of teenagers, what is there to like about grammar? You'll notice that I've underlined the word teenagers because I'm speaking particularly about teachers of teenagers. What I say is not only uh, limited to that, but this is the main uh, objective of my talk is talking about teenagers. What is there to like about grammar? Well, first of all, I 
explain from my experience, we had like grammar translation on one side and then communication on the other side as if they were opposites. And I think you'll agree with me that they are not opposites. Grammar is not the opposite of communication. Grammar is a part of communication. And I believe that it can speed up the process of learning to use a language. So grammar is something which helps us to communicate. Now, this is a quotation by a famous uh, linguist, David Wilkins, a great book, an old book, but a great book, Linguistics in Language Teaching. While without grammar, little can be conveyed. Without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. So the, the heart of a language, if you like, I think we would probably again agree. We've got vocabulary and we've also got grammar. We can communicate lots just by naming things, just by saying words. But with grammar, we can do more with those words. We can put them in different uh, tenses, for example. So I think that's an interesting uh, starting point. Grammar as a part of communication. Michael Swan, a very famous writer, I'm sure you know the name, um, another sent, uh, quotation by him, who he's obviously a big grammar fan, uh, languages have structural features that are complicated and hard to learn, and he says that uh, for learners to master them, adequate experience, understanding and use of these features is necessary. Um, so he is arguing that we need to teach uh, grammar because it's part of language to be able to master the language. And he goes on to say that uh, because our time is limited, right, I imagine that most of you are like me. I only have three hours a week to expose my students to language. If they were living in the UK, they might find it easier to simply pick up the language. But I would say that in our situation, if you are teaching away from the UK or from the US or from Australia, then basically their exposure is not great. And we need to give them that language in handy um, sections of language, as it says here, informed by a syllabus. In other words, what you're going to find in most textbooks is different grammar points that are going to help our students to be able to learn more and to be able to use the language. So grammar is not the opposite of communication. Now, I would argue that when we teach grammar inductively, so that means when we get students to work out the rules for themselves, we're not just teaching English, we're not just teaching grammar, we are helping our students to develop thinking skills, thinking strategies, picking out patterns in language, um, working things out for themselves. Uh, in other words, uh, as I say, thinking skills that are really useful, not just for learning a language, but for their lives in general. So I think this is um, a skill that is like particularly uh, useful for all of our teenagers to develop. Now, um, you can see this is a grammar box from Gateway to the World, B1+, looking at stative and dynamic verbs. You don't need to look at all of that information, but you'll notice that, for example, in 1A, I've got a question. Do the verbs in bold describe states and situations, or do they describe actions? I've got a question, two questions in 1B. Are they in the present simple or present continuous? Why? And um, in 1C, uh, sorry, in 1D, why are the verbs in the sentences in the present simple, but in the present continuous in two? So basically what I'm suggesting is asking our students lots of questions, getting them to think about the language, helping them to detect patterns and to work it out for themselves, which I think is really good for their uh, own development in terms of thinking. Now, the opposite. Uh, sometimes in our classes, we simply teach the students. Uh, they don't know the third conditional, and we go in and we explain the third conditional. We explain how we use it. We explain why we use it. We explain uh, the, uh, the formation of the third conditional. And to be honest, I think that teachers, hopefully, you like teaching, and hopefully you feel good about teaching transmitting knowledge from yourself to people who don't know what you know is a pretty good feeling and i think it's also um 
it's also uh, a very satisfying feeling for you and a very useful feeling for the students. Uh, I've seen one person saying that they can't see my screen, but I can see it. Maybe you could confirm in the chat box if you can see it. Also, somebody saying it's a bit too small, but it's enormously big for me. Um, yeah, you can see it, right? Uh, maybe, I don't know if somebody could help with a technical question there. Yeah. Okay, so teaching things to our students makes us feel good. The fourth point that I would make is students' expectations. And I think this is really useful. I'm teaching in a school, not in a language school. And my students, they learn things in biology class, they learn things in history class, they learn things in philosophy, in economics. I think there's a danger with English that sometimes maybe the students feel they're not learning anything, that they are practicing, that they're maybe doing a song, maybe watching a video, but they don't know what they're learning. And I think that grammar is, if you like, part of the serious content of our classes. And I think that some students, lots of parents, expect their students to learn something in a lesson. And I think that grammar and vocabulary is the way that we can make sure that we're teaching our students something that we are, and I'm saying this a lot in inverted commas, that we are a serious subject. So, um, yeah, I think that it's very, very uh, important that we do teach something and grammar is the obvious content that we can actually teach. Now, this is a point that um, I think there is an, another side to what I'm about to say, but I think that you would probably agree. You can tell me in the chat box if you agree or disagree, just say yes or no. But I believe that with larger classes of teenagers, 20, 25, 30 students, it can be easier to teach grammar than to do oral work, for example, or pair work or group work. Uh, a lot of you are saying, of course, yes, you agree. Um, now, I will come back to a, a different side of this question, but I think you would agree that it is actually much easier to be able to actually teach grammar than to be able to do, for example, a little uh, debate in different uh, groups or pairs. And I think I'm pretty sure that you're going to agree with number six. Testing grammar is much easier, quicker, and also probably more objective than, for example, testing speaking. If I want to test speaking, which I do, but when I test speaking with my, my class of 25 students, it takes me weeks, okay? So it can take a long time to be able to test people. And then it's still slightly less objective, I would say slightly more subjective to give a mark. So I think that's another reason why we quite like grammar, because it's something that's easy to test and something that is objective to test. And I think because of the last two things that I've said, I think it's probably also true then that when you've got a difficult class, by difficult, I mean that they're maybe loud, uh, moving around. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's actually grammar becomes a way that we can put some order into our classes. Now, I'm sure particularly with the last things that I've just said, you're thinking the same as it says on this, uh, this slide here. Yes, but because some of the things I've said, you could then maybe give me a counter argument. So let's see some of the reasons why sometimes perhaps we should feel guilty about teaching grammar or possibly feeling guilty about the way that we teach grammar. So here are a few things to think about. We've talked about grammar and communication. The important thing to remember, in my view, is that grammar is not the objective. We are not doing an English grammar class. We're doing an English class, and knowing grammar, knowing about grammar, is not our main objective. Our main objective is to help our students to use English proficiently. It is not to be an expert in the present perfect. It is not to be an expert in the passive or the causative. What we want is our students to be able to use this grammar and to use this language. So grammar is not the aim. Grammar is a tool which helps us to teach English, English usage. Now, this is a quotation from Michael Swan again, and it really feels like he's speaking about my own experiences. He can recite long lists of irregular verbs, but he can't ask for a coffee 
We don't want that to happen, right? We don't want our students to be able to recite a long list of irregular verbs because you can't communicate directly with a long list of irregular verbs. I'm not saying it's not useful, but it's not the objective. The objective is to be able to use the language. That is why if you use Gateway or if you've seen Gateway, Gateway to the World, the latest edition, you'll know that on the grammar pages in the grammar sections, the last exercise is always called use it, don't lose it. We want our students to use this grammar. We don't want them to know about it. We want them to use it. So we've always got an activity which is a communicative activity. Uh, we're giving a situation and we're getting the students to use this new grammar in this situation. So use it, use the grammar that we are teaching. That is our objective. Another thing that I think we need to be very careful about is becoming a pathological grammar obsessive. And I think again, um, that most of us, including myself, sometimes we do become pathological grammar obsessives. What do I mean? Well, I mean that a student walks into my class and I say, how are you today, Ivan? And Ivan says to me, very bad teacher, very, very bad. Yesterday, my father had an accident, okay? And you know that you are grammar pathological obsessive if you reply, no, Ivan, that's terrible, that's terrible. It should be my father had an accident. And then if you are really a grammar obsessive, you say it's the past simple for a single completed action with a specific time reference. Now, I'm joking about this, but I think that it is true that as teachers, we are often trained to spot grammar mistakes. We're often trained to find out what's going wrong. And of course, here, Ivan has communicated completely successfully. I understand exactly what Ivan has said. So what I'm trying to say here is that, yes, grammar is important, but this is not the most important thing. Here we're talking about lots of things. We're talking about empathizing. We're talking about creating relationships. And we're also talking about simply communication. And the student has communicated. So let's not become obsessive about grammar. Another thing to mention um, is I think that if we think about the ratio of teacher presentation and student practice, I think you would hopefully agree with me that we should be a uh, short presentation, lots of practice. Student centered, we need the students to use, practice the language, make mistakes, of course, and then learn from their mistakes. But we shouldn't be giving 25 minute lectures about the present perfect. We should be giving short, efficient presentations and then getting lots and lots of practice. I mentioned this before about using grammar to control large classes and difficult classes, but I think we need to be really careful that we do not use grammar as a way of punishing our classes. Grammar should not be punishment. We need a principled approach. In other words, yes, it can be easier to teach uh, grammar, but we need to think why are we teaching the way that we're thinking and what is the best way that we can get good results with our students, helping them to learn to use English. So we shouldn't use grammar, I believe, as only a form of control or as a form of punishment. And I said before that it can be easier, and I think you agreed with me, it can be easier to teach grammar than to do speaking, but that does not mean that we should not be doing speaking. We need to do speaking. We need to work out ways to help it work. We need to think of ways of making pair work efficient, um, but we should not basically give up the other skills, the four skills, speaking, listening, reading, writing, just because it's easier to teach grammar. Two last points. One is that um, I think you would agree with me again that uh, not all students get grammar at the same pace. They don't all understand it or start to use it correctly. 
Students have got different um, skills, different strengths. Some of them might be better at sort more functional type of work and others might be better at the grammar. We need to be ready for mixed abilities, right? Which is a, a session that I gave recently uh, for a global festival for Macmillan. And you can find the webinar, I think on YouTube, the Macmillan YouTube channel. Um, but basically we need to be ready for mixed abilities and we need to vary our methods of presentation and practice that way different students will learn uh, on different uh, in different ways and we can help by having that variety of presentation and practice and um finally i think you would probably agree with me yes i mean grammar can be complex it can be confusing it can be uninspiring it does depend on how we present it and how we practice it so um, it's up to us as well to make grammar interesting and to make it meaningful and to be able to uh, help our students to learn it efficiently. And uh, I would say that really the key, as always, is motivation. We need to motivate our students so that they enjoy learning and practicing grammar. And that is going to be the basis for the second half of my talk now. So looking at some practical examples of what works for me. So after 35, 36 years of teaching, what works for me with my largest classes of teenage students? Well, for me, a key concept is the idea of presenting and practicing grammar in context. I've noticed that in the, gra in the chat box, some of you have mentioned this, we have to present uh, grammar in context. I think it helps. And I think the uh, if the context, by teaching grammar in context, we're helping to make it natural, motivating, content rich, and the students are learning something at the same time as they are learning uh, the English grammar. And I want to show an example of something um, that I think leads nicely to a little grammar point in a very natural way. This is from a news website called The Conversation. And it has a section, Curious Kids, where young people can write in and ask experts for uh, their opinion about a question that they would like to know. And this question, which is an interesting question, if humans went extinct, what would the Earth look like one year later? Well, in the chat box, I'd like you to uh, share some of your ideas. What would the world, world look like one year after humans becoming extinct? What do you think? How would it look? What would it be? How would it be different? So Maye is saying it would be greener, right? It would be a nice place. It would be rebuilt, uh, rebuilt eventually, cleaner, better air quality. The air would be fresher. Thank you for that. It would be sad. Okay. It would be a better place for other living things, right? That's an interesting concept, right? Right now, the point that I want to make um, is that many of you, if not most of you, if you're not answering in just a couple of words, you are using the second conditional. And you're using the second conditional. Look, I've got it would be peaceful. That second conditional, right? We're using the second conditional because this is a natural context for the second conditional. We have an imaginary situation. So it's a hypothetical situation. We're imagining this situation and what the consequences would be. So without me saying anything, many of you are coming up with sentences like this. Things would sound much quieter. Look, Rina has just said a silent place. Exactly. <laughs> the sky would be bluer. The air would be fresher. At night, everything would be dark because there wouldn't be any electricity. And there would be more insects, plants, and wild animals. Now, if you like, let's forget this, um, you know, worrying about the world, uh, humans becoming extinct. But let's think about what I'm saying in terms of grammar. What I am saying in terms of grammar is that when we give a natural context where the second conditional will come out totally naturally and we've got a meaningful context, then I would say this is this would be perfect for a grammar presentation. We're focusing at the moment. You're not focusing on the grammar. Your students are not focusing on the grammar. They're focusing on the context. This context, it's maybe not a very happy context. 
but it's a context that maybe is worth discussing in class with our students, thinking about these consequences, helping us think about sustainability, for example. So I would say that we're doing um, different things at the same time. We are looking at grammar, but we are looking at a meaningful context. So why is the meaningful motivating context so important? Well, I think that, as I've just said, they exemplify and aid natural use. The students understand the second conditional because they understand this hypothetical situation. I think that it means that we can teach interesting things. Somebody's mentioned, uh, so tired of doing if I were a boy. This leads to something new that they haven't maybe thought about before. So we've got some meaningful inputs that they're learning something as well as grammar. In this in, in that case, I believe, and from my own experience, I think that contexts help to make language more memorable. And I think at the same time, decontextualization is unnatural. We use grammar in context. We don't suddenly have a sentence and we never have a sentence, swim, swam, swamp. So again, I'm not against teaching irregular verbs, but we need a context where verbs are gonna come out and we're going to be able to pick them out and focus on them. So I believe then that teaching needs that important context so that we're teaching something at the same time. Now, let's think about practice for a second. Before I showed you this box, which is looking at stative verbs, state verbs and dynamic verbs, verbs describing situations and verbs describing uh, actions. If you look at 1C, we've got typical verbs that go in the present simple, not the present continuous. So verbs of the senses, hear, sound, see, taste, feel. Now, imagine that we want to give a context to practice these verbs. Then how about this from Gateway to the World B1 Plus? Some of you may know this. We've got two different shapes. One of them is called Kiki and one of them is called Booba. In the chat box, I would like you to write A or B, which one do you think is Booba? Which one is Booba? Right, okay. Lots of Bs. Lots and lots and lots of Bs. Now, statistically, uh, 90, between 90 and 95% always say B, which is pretty incredible, right? We just have a shape an irregular shape on the screen. And most of you know or know or you feel that this is booba. I have another question for you. One of these is lemonade and one of these is milk chocolate. Which one do you think is lemonade, A or B? Okay, we've suddenly switched lots of A's, lots of A's. A is lemonade, somebody says. Okay, this is fascinating, right? Um, so it's a really interesting context. This is, as I say, from Gateway to the World. We've got this really interesting con. Why are we all, we all agree, right? Nearly all agree that A is lemonade and B is milk chocolate. Well, here we have a text which is practicing these verbs, practicing saying it tastes like milk chocolate, it sounds like kiki, it sounds like booba. And basically this context is helping us then to give some meaningful, uh, meaningful um, context to the exercise. And I believe that this is memorable. Um, it's interesting, of course, the idea is that maybe, apparently this works in different languages too, not just in English, uh, it works in any language that most people agree about those Kiki and Buba shapes, very interesting. And the text helps to explain a little bit about this experiment. So have a look at that in Gateway to the World B1 Plus if you can simply a way of making sure students think about the context as they practice the grammar. Now, I teach teenagers and I believe that game-like exercises can really help to motivate our students. So here's an exercise, which is one of my favorites. I do this in many talks. I'm gonna show you a picture for three seconds and then I want you to let me know what you remember about what was happening in the picture. Okay, here we go, three seconds. You've got three seconds to look at that picture. And now 
I would like you to tell me what was happening. What was happening in this picture? Can anybody, an old man was being mugged. Thank you, Denisa. Two people were robbing another. Two thieves. Wow, this is going so fast. Uh, there was somebody about the, somebody playing, somebody was playing a game, right? A sport. An old woman was running to help. As uh, somebody was leaving a cab, policemen are coming right now. This is great. Um, I just want you to think about the activity again. So if you like, forget the picture and think about the activity. I could show you this picture without taking it away, but it would not be motivating. It wouldn't be a challenge. It wouldn't be a game. It would simply be a, a simple question where it's obvious that I just want to practice the grammar. If I take away the picture, I'm making it more challenging. I'm making it into a game. And this for me is how we should be uh, treating grammar, turning the language into a game. We talked about natural contexts. This is a natural context. You're using the past continuous because you're describing a scene in the past. If your students don't use the past continuous, then at this stage of the lesson, you want to remind them, OK, please, I would like you to use the past continuous uh, in this activity. But basically, without saying anything, you are using the past continuous because it is natural and meaningful to do that. OK. Um, and that's what we do in the in the exercise, then in Gateway to the World, then we ask them more questions. Maybe somebody could answer the question in six. What was the lady in the hat doing? Does anybody remember the lady in the hat? Reaching for the man. I think she was. I'm going to show you the picture again. And she was screaming. Somebody said she was screaming. There she is. Yeah. She's like screaming. She's also holding a bag or two bags, I think. And she's also she was also walking the child. Thank you, Nelly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, she was walking the child. Right. So the activity, I think, is clear. You can um, show this uh, to the students. Alessandra is asking a question. Yes, this is practice, right? You could use it for presentation to see if they know the past continuous. That could save time because maybe they can use it without you explaining anything. But imagine that they don't know the past continuous then you use this exercise as your initial practice, for example. By the way, that picture was of a real news story, which is that Benedict Cumberbatch was the man coming out of the taxi. And apparently he did, in fact, help to uh, save somebody who was being mugged in New York City. OK, so that's a real life story for you um, and the picture uh, there to help make more motivating. Now, we talked about game-like activities. I would also mention the idea of competition, competitive spirit. Um, and I think we can do this nicely uh, without getting too obsessed with competition, but simply making it a little game where the students can win points. This is an activity to practice question formation, which is very tricky in English to get it right. In the chat box, if you write a question for me, which is grammatically correct. And if my answer to your question is yes, then you get two different points, okay? One point for getting it uh, correct and one point for getting an answer yes. Can anybody think of a question to ask me where my answer is yes? Is the sky blue, Sanchez, Penelope Sanchez? Yes, it is. Do you love teaching zoo? Yes, I do. Two points. Are you a man, Irina? Yes, I am. Two points. Have you been abroad? Yes, I have. Do I like teaching? Yes, I do. Do you? Right. OK, you're getting lots of points. Imagine doing this with your class. OK, it's fun. There's a bit of competition. Can each student get two points? Obviously, if they make a mistake, we're not going to be mad angry with them. But it's simply a way of motivating our students to use the grammar and to use it correctly. Maria de Lourdes, yes, I do love being here and I'm enjoying myself a lot. I hope you're enjoying the session. Right, I've got another game for you, another game. Um, and this is a way of focusing on grammatical accuracy for a second. And, um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to motivate students to try and be as precise as possible. 
So this is one way to try to do that. Um, this is high level B2 plus C1, modal verbs of uh, obligation, prohibition, advice. My students were making lots of mistakes. They were getting the grammar wrong, not because they didn't understand, but because um, but because they were making mistakes with the form of the verbs, which can be tricky. The competition is very simple. How many sentences can you make that are grammatically correct with any of the words in this box? Have a go in the uh, have a go in the uh, chat box. It's always fun to see your sentences. How who can write a correct sentence using these verbs? You needn't speak it. That's beautiful. Osnat Abu Ali, thank you. I speak well. Do you speak English? Right. I think. Shouldn't you have studied harder? That's nice. You should have studied harder. That is nice. Now, you see, my students were making lots of mistakes like you should to study or you should had studied and they were making lots of mistakes. And that's why I came up with this game. And suddenly, miraculously, my students were not making so many mistakes because they were enjoying the game. So just to repeat, remember that you will get access to this talk after the talk in your goodie bag, I think. Uh, what we're saying is that by doing these games, we can help to increase accuracy. Just a couple of last points before I uh, try and do a quick Q&A session with you. We've got uh, careful structuring and staging of grammar practice exercises for me is very important. So we're going to start from more controlled exercises and go to more uh, less controlled freer activities. We're going to try to go from identifying correct for uh, correct forms to then asking the students to come up with them forms themselves. We're going from simply doing mechanical exercises where you're changing the form of the verb to creating original sentences and that takes me to my fifth point which is that i think it's really important that we give our students the possibility to make the grammar theirs by coming up with sentences that nobody has come up with before i'm going to give you a, an example of this um, this is a particular uh, type of exercise called dilemmas, right? Using the second conditional. What would you do if this happened to you? Okay, so thinking about different situations. This is from Gateway to the World B2. I've got one situation in the chat box. What would you do in this situation? So you're in a restaurant. They bring you a different dish to the one you ordered. It's much bigger, better, and it's also more expensive. What would you do if you were in the situation in a restaurant? What would you do? Now, while you're answering that question, I'm going to continue explaining the exercise. This exercise, I think, is good. This would be a final exercise where the students have practiced the form. They've understood how we make the second conditional. They've done very controlled exercises. And now they are creating their own sentences to express what they particularly think. So we've got lots of different answers in the chat box. Yeah, some people wouldn't complain, okay? Some people would just eat the dish. Yeah, I think, I, I'm not sure what I would do. I might, if I liked it, maybe I would eat it. Edna, yes, I like that. You would eat it and thank the waiter. That's nice. Okay, and the last point that I want to make is simply that it's very important when we teach grammar that we do lots of frequent revision. We can't teach a grammatical structure on Monday and think that the students are going to remember it and know it and be able to use it. That's why at the end of each unit in Gateway, in Gateway to the World, we have the grammar reference section there and not at the back of the book. So that the students immediately when they finish the units, they can check, they can look at what they've just done and see if they remember it and if they understand it. We give them practice activities to revise the grammar. And if they are having problems with it, then we can send them somewhere else for more practice. That's right, Bruno. I think it's really useful that it's at the end of the unit and not at the back of the book so that students see it straight away and can do a quick recap. One thing, by the way, in the workbook, we have cumulative revision. And I think that's also important. At the end of unit six, we don't just revise unit six, we revise units one, two, three, four, five. 
Um, there is no point in students only remembering what they did in the last unit. We want them to remember what they did at the beginning of the year too. And finally, talking about revision, remember that today with um, all of our digital resources, with Gateway to the World, we've got these grammar flipped classroom videos. The students can watch these at any moment. They can look back at them and they can, um, they can use them as reinforcement. There's also lots of grammar games. We've got grammar ex ex extra exercises. Um, so remember that you've got all of that, uh, those different resources to provide as much revision as possible. Okay, I'm at the end of my session, and I thought that grammar is uh, always a very serious topic, but I've got a few grammar jokes for you, okay? I've got two grammar jokes for you. You all know the joke, right, that like a man walked into a bar, or we've got like a penguin walked into a bar. Well, this is the grammar equivalent of this joke, okay? So my joke is the past, the present, and the future walked into a bar. It was tense. Okay, I'm sorry, it's a very bad joke. It is a terrible joke, but still, somebody said this morning that it is a dad joke, and I accept full responsibility for my dad joke. My second and last dad joke, and then I'm finishing for Q&A. Why? Yes, so this question, yeah. Why is nostalgia like a grammar lesson? And the answer is because you find the present tense and the past perfect. Okay, so classic joke there. I'm glad, uh, yes, it's a bad joke, but if you want to share any bad jokes, and if you want to ask him any questions or comments, please do join me at the uh, Facebook page, Teach With Dave. And uh, Alejandra, I think we have like a couple yeah. of minutes, right, for, Hello, for some questions. Dave. Hello. How are you? It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Yeah, we have lots of questions. We're going to just mention a few, okay, because of uh, the time. Sure. Uh, the first question is feedback. What piece of advice can you give us? How should we give feedback? When we, for example, do an exercise and the students make mistakes, what is your piece of advice? That's a good question. Somebody yes asked about correction and whether it should be immediate or not. I think it depends on the activity, right? Um, more than anything, we need to make sure that we do give thinking time, right? So that our students aren't, you know, when we speak, we make mistakes because we haven't got time to think. But I think if we're doing a grammar exercise, we need to give that thinking time. Uh, I also am a big fan of people being able to compare and work with their partner so that they can share ideas and help each other. I'm also a big fan of peer correction so that students can also help one another to correct exercises. Um, let's imagine that we were doing the exercise with the picture of New York. Uh, I think there, if your students are coming out with sentences and they're making mistakes, I would try and elicit from the students, him or herself, if they can correct themselves first, if not, see if another student in the class could maybe help to correct that student. And if nobody can do that, then I would step in and correct. Um, it depends on the exercise, doesn't it? So it depends on the exercise, if it's a written exercise, if it's spoken exercise. Um, if we're doing more of a game-like activity, I would try not to interrupt in the middle of the activity because you're going to ruin the game and the uh, the yeah, momentum, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Always, um, I think that raising awareness much more than spoon feeding and that's right. Getting students to think again. Just grammar in isolation. Yeah, that's right. Very, very interesting. Um, and of course, you have focused on grammar in connection with teenagers, but. There's an interesting question. What is the best age to start systematizing grammar, to start talking about grammar? What's your opinion, Dave, your um, expert I, opinion? I, I would say again that actually that it is secondary where, you know, high school where we're starting to do this. You know, I sometimes have seen teachers, you know, doing the third conditional with primary students you know and conceptually that's very very difficult you know to concentrate on something not motivational i think secondary is a good moment because they've kind of seen the language a lot before maybe they have some fossilized mistakes and secondary this is a great moment to go back look at this language analyze it a bit more because the students are able to conceptualize a little bit more they're able to understand grammatical forms and concepts a little bit more uh, so I think that actually for me, you know, secondary is the age when students are really starting to be able to look at grammar in this slightly more analytical more way. More abstract way. 
run. Yes. Run. Anyway, in primary, we would still do grammar in different ways, perhaps more visual, more TPR thing, but. That's right. I think I was, yes, I, I was, sorry, I was, I think I meant sort of teaching it explicitly, as it were. Yeah, yeah. explicitly. Yeah, grammar is always yeah. there. And grammar yes. is necessary, right? Right. It, now, exactly. um, uh, you know that in, in many countries, and I, I think everywhere, we have mixed ability classes. And uh, what is your number one tip for a mixed ability class, for heterogeneous, but large groups? N my number one tip is being ready for it. And being ready for it means having <laughs> having things uh, up your sleeve. Um, I, I did a, a, a webinar for Macmillan, a global webinar recently about uh, mixed abilities and actually in gateway to the world. You know, we have this on the grammar pages. We actually have extra activities, right, where w those students who finish fast, because for me, the question is often the fast finishers. How do we keep them occupied? in a constructive way. For me, the key is having exercises that are maybe quite fun also, uh, but we have extra exercises for those fast finishes. Um, and if you're if you're using Gateway to the World, in a way you're lucky because you've got some of those exercises already given to you, right? So you don't need a photocopy, you don't need anything else. And there's so much variety that each page is another instance, another opportunity to learn. Definitely, definitely. That's right. Well, Dave, it's been such a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Now I'm going to. Uh, yeah. Yes, let me stop sharing. Thank you very much, everybody. And okay, uh, yeah, yeah, I might even I might see some of you in a minute, actually, if you're going to one of the talks. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a surprise for you. Okay, see you in a bit. I'm going to share bye my bye. screen. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Give me a second, please, because I cannot share my screen. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. I can't be sharing my screen. Give me a second. Here we go. Yes, right. As usual, you know, with technology, there is always. <laughs> yes, okay. Okay. So um, today, as you have just heard, uh, I'm going to show it. There we go. We have talked about grammar. We have talked about grammar and especially grammar with teenagers. And um, the idea is that Nowhere else will you see grammar in such a motivating way, such an interesting way as a gateway to the world. Okay, this series for teenagers offers us everything you need, everything we need, like very clear grammar and the flipped classroom, okay, with Dave and uh, the grammar gurus explaining grammar in a really fun way, motivating videos that your students will understand because they also have a lot of visual inputs. Uh, those of you who are interested in projects, you have very interesting projects that are collaborative. And not only that, um, these projects also come with the opportunity to join the virtual classroom exchange program. And what is that? You have the opportunity to join other classes in other countries, okay, and discuss the project that you have done, uh, how you did it. Uh, your students are going to be face to face with other students in other parts of the world. A really interesting opportunity. Then, of course, uh, social and emotional learning, and that is very, very, very important. And um, Social and emotional learning in connection with great learners, great thinkers, and this goes hand in hand with 
um, visual thinking routines. I don't know if you have heard that, but this is based on Project Zero from Harvard University. And when you develop all these routines in the classroom, you are making your students much more communicative, much more or better thinkers, better learners, because you are making them aware of a lot, a lot of things. Um, we also, when we come to secondary, and especially when we work with a book like Gateway to the World, we are interested in exams. So there is thorough exam preparation, okay? A lot of very uh, interesting activities to prepare your students for the different exams, but not just activities. All, all the tips you need. So, Gateway to the World, an ideal course uh, for teenagers.